question. I just got to put on the recording for the class and we're all here again together for what, the last session of the year, Scott? Yeah. Yeah, next week we'll start all over again. I'll do my introduction class. So hopefully we'll get some some new people come, come in and so that won't be just preaching to the choir. All you guys telling you all my story that you've already heard before, but but I'd love to have whoever wants to show up. I'm, <laughs> I'm telling people about it. That's oh, great. great. We appreciate it. And, you know, ultimately they'll appreciate it if they actually choose to come to a number of classes and change their life. Mm -hmm. Your conversation that I joined about um, having the family conversation over fat and is the same conversation I just had with my two sons at uh, Christmas dinner. And um, um, they're very, um, one of them works at Peace Health and he says he's surrounded by endocrinologists and they all say, eat cheese, eat cheese, you know? And uh, so they're <laughs> blowing off everything I have to say and I don't really have the statistics or the credentials to really back. So I don't want to get an argument or anything, but. I just stuck to my guns, you know, and um, just have to let it ride out. Yeah, That's good for you. Go ahead. That's what we have to do too. You know, you, you teach them to respect their elders. <laughs> 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 but when they get a mind of their own, <laughs> he's almost 50. So yeah, <laughs> mine, mine too. And, I, you know, I don't consider it disrespect. I just consider it, and you know, a, for, uh, a debate that I wish I could be on their level, you know, but, um, but uh, I think uh, I'm 75 and they're not 50 yet. So they've got, we, we all learn at our own pace. <laughs> yeah. So I took my son, uh, he's uh, 50. It took him to just about 50 and a cancer of the bladder to uh, have him actually look at the science and make the change to Ooh. do something different with his diet. Yeah. And uh, he's still not 100%, but he's getting pretty close. And uh, yeah. uh, he gets another scare in his life over something, and that may be enough to finally convince yeah. him. So yeah. unfortunately, yeah. that's what it has taken for so many people, some really significant health issue to scare them. Yeah. Anybody else have uh, some words of wisdom or? I was, at, I was grocery shopping and I found a magazine at the checkout stand that I normally don't buy magazines there. Uh -huh. so the Forks and Knives, is that, is that the um, name? Yes. And it had a magazine full of recipes, all plant-based. So I snatched it. And it's really a good 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 um resource yes um there is forks over knives is an excellent resource and i think you can go online and get free recipes yeah. also uh dr john mcdougall has a, a website which has recipes from around the world and oh man there are so many other sites too. Yeah. It's becoming pretty common these days. Yeah. Um, okay. Anyone else? I don't know, Charlie, if you saw the question we got in uh, email about to revisit the uh, um, DEXA scans, uh, DEXA scan machines, you know, we, we, seen heard heard that you know there's been a lot of variability between machines the accuracy of the from machine to machine if you use the same machine it it's not it's not too bad as far as reliability for detecting osteopenia and osteoporosis but from machine to machine it seems to be a wider variation so that was a because the because they said that they'd read that it was that they were reliable but I think it has more to do with from machine to machine. It's it's the data is a little bit unreliable, but but uh, but you know anyone that's interested in that particular question in osteoporosis, you can watch that class that's recorded on osteoporosis. We revisit that topic on, in that class. Okay. okay. 
I also would like to make a editorializing comment about our concerns over osteoporosis. Our number one killer in our country is heart disease. It's not osteoporosis. Osteoporosis has become a, an illness um, that to promote a lot of medicines. I know I've been in practice for 40, I don't know, over 45 years. And uh, I've never seen people just dropping over like flies uh, or developing uh, hip fractures uh, in the quantities that come anywhere close to the issues connected with heart disease, diabetes, cancers, and other chronic illnesses, which are doing us in. And we spend a lot of time ruminating about what to do for osteoporosis when our bones generally hold up pretty well in spite of the fear that we have over the fact that our bones are gonna crumble uh, because that's what's in the news. I guess I, I try to reassure people there are other issues which are so much more likely to be a problem unless you choose to make really healthy lifestyle choices. And that includes what you eat, eating a whole food plant-based diet that's uh, uh, not very processed, moving throughout the day on a regular basis, not being sedentary, avoiding chemicals like smoking and drinking and some doctor pills and stress, how you're dealing with stress in your life, the things you can do to keep yourself healthy. So I try to talk to the medical students about that. Focus your attention uh, and their attention, your patient's attention on these factors and try not to get too hung up on one illness. Just my editorializing for tonight. Yes, Nikki. I agree. Okay, well, I've got a question about osteoporosis. In um, uh, so last uh, winter, I was starting to have uh, difficulty walking. With uh, I'm, I'm a well. I used to be a mountain girl. I mean, you know, big time uh, mountain backpacker and hiker and um, I was starting to have trouble walking with um, my uh, legs getting numb and uh, tingling and in, in physical therapy for a long time till finally she said, well, you need more of an evaluation. So finally I, uh, through a doctor, got an MRI who kind of was very alarmed and said, oh my God, you've got extremely severe spinal stenosis. And it, um, yeah, it was the the radiologist report at one one level described it as cli uh, critically severe. So I did end up needing to get um, a simple laminectomy, which I recovered from really well. Was able to walk around the block the next day, and um, um, that you know it really did alleviate those symptoms. So. But you know, now I'm sort of. You talked about crumbling bones. Now I'm kind of concerned about a crumbling spine. And um, so, you know, I did some wonderful hiking over the summer, but then started to get new, new symptoms where it's just one leg, but just um, extreme, extreme uh, pain. And I think I'm little by little getting it evaluated. It's they call it ridiculous. Ridicu what Ridiculopathy. Is Ridiculopathy. So I think what it is is a pinched nerve coming off off one side, and so uh, I'm trying to stay as healthy as I can be. It's a difficult time right now over the holidays because things have really, really slowed down. It's real hard to get a diagnosis, but I'm my walking is so poor that I'm uh, sometimes. Um, walking with crutches or walker because I can't bear weight on that leg. And I mean, and the pain is unlike anything I've ever had before as far as this incredible stabbing. But so anyway, is there anything I can do uh, diet wise? And I think part of this is kind of due to osteoporosis, although my DEXA scan said uh, the beginnings of osteopenia. But is there anything I can do 
to, I mean, maybe an inflammation, low inflammation diet probably, because I think probably these nerve areas are inflamed, but anything along the lines of that I need to pay attention to more than what I'm already doing with trying to, you know, eat cleaner, better. So go ahead, Scott. I, yeah, so actually I used to work in interventional pain management for two years up in Portland. So I've got a, a good background in, in your problem. So, you know, once you've had a laminectomy, which is essentially taking the back piece of the bone off of your spine to free up room for the nerve that was being pinched, the spinal stenosis. And uh, so once you've done that, which you have, you know, it does put you at higher risk of having de degradation of that area. And a lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of patients that have laminectomies in the future, if they have more symptoms, they end up having to have spinal fusion surgery where they put hardware in and actually fuse that area. Of course, I, I'm a little bit biased because the patients I saw for two years were patients that had had multiple back surgeries and didn't do well. And we, and we did epidural steroid injections and therapy and medications, spinal cord stimulators. So I worked with an anesthesiologist and neurosurgeons for two years and saw the real severe uh, patients in, in that category. But what I would say is, you know, if you, if you do continue to have symptoms, you know, it's, you probably should get in to see your provider, get physical therapy, consider that there's other modalities like acupuncture, the epidural steroid injections that they interventional pain specialists could do. If you're trying to avoid additional surgery, you know, you want to go that route. Now, that being said, everything you mentioned earlier is, is what you want to do. So, you know, whole food plant-based diet, anti-inflammatory to reduce the inflammation, but, you know, you can only, that can only take you so far when there's a structural problem there. And if there is a you know, uh, you know, herniated disc there or something or something else that, that's moving, it's degrading uh, just over time, partially because of the surgery you had, then you might, you know, might be limited in what you can do. But, um, but I would say, yeah, uh, it wouldn't hurt, wouldn't hurt to do both things. But, but to answer your other part of the question, the, if you have a little bit of osteopenia, that's likely not contributing to your, sp your spinal symptoms. That's, that's completely separate. But, you know, to, to promote bone health, you want to do all the things that Charlie just talked about, whole food, plant-based diet, weight-bearing exercise, get your vitamin D, don't smoke, uh, do resistance exercise, do as much as you can do uh, just for overall bone health in general. And then those same changes will also reduce inflammation and then, um, and then make sure you see your provider about, about those other things I talked about. Well, the, yeah, the good news is I already, um, yeah, I'm working with a, a I just started to see a rehab medicine doctor who seems to, I mean, seems to really, really know his stuff. It's just the beginning, uh, but I've already, on, based on his referral, seen the surgeon and, and she said, I mean, she said that it doesn't look like I'm going to need another surgery at this point, which is good. And they're talking good. about a fluoroscope guided um, epidural, which is going to be a few weeks out just because everything's so backed up. And... Um, but what I don't understand is, isn't it kind of osteoporosis? Isn't it somewhat that the spine is crumbling? Isn't it the bones uh, crumbling, you know, and, and that stuff starting to get pinched like that? Um, or... It's usually more the disc space gets, gets smaller. So it's, you know, there are people that develop vertebral fractures and you can get osteoporosis in your, in your spinal vertebrae. But usually most people that have, have nerve problems in their back it has to do with the de degradation of the discs, the actual discs between the, the vertebrae. That's usually what gets sh shrunk in size. And that when people lose height and stuff like that, a lot of it is from that. And then um, because if the when the disc is gets smaller, shrinks, then there's less room between the levels, the blocks basically, less level because they because they're think of the discs as spacers. We, we kind of use them as shock absorbers because we're we stand erect when we're our spines are actually designed to be on all fours. If you look at our way our spine is physiologically, it's we're designed to be a quadruped on all fours, but we use it as shock absorbers because we stand erect. But the so think of the discs as spacers and the spacers get smaller. And when the spaces I, I kind of need a, a spine model to show you to kind of show you how it works, but when those spaces get smaller, then the, the the place where the nerves come off the spinal cord 
at each of those levels is shrunken. So it's, it's so there's, it's called the foramen. So you get foraminal stenosis and then it's pinching. And so when you're going to get that epidural steroid injection, they're going to put a numbing medicine in there and some steroid in there to try to reduce the inflammation in there, hopefully taking off some of the pressure off of the nerve that that's, but it, it's usually a temporary fix most of the time, but yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, hopefully you can avoid surgery. That would be good. Thank you. I'd like to add a little bit more uh, to give you all some thought. And it's something that I never knew much about until, I don't know, 10 or 11 years ago when I changed what I was eating and started listening to Dr. Greger and, and others. And um, I learned that the blood supply to your, um, your vertebrae and your discs the, the arteries are, are kind of small. And if you get clogged up arteries, you can get kind of a decreased blood flow. It's not really great to those cartilaginous discs that Scott just talked about. And so you need as the good flow. If you don't have really great flow, uh, then you can get this degeneration or uh, shortening compression of these discs as they degenerate. And so think about it this way. You know, what's our number one killer? It's heart disease. What usually happens with that? We sort of got, start getting clogged arteries. They develop plaque. The plaque breaks. We have heart attack. Uh, erectile dysfunction. We get decreased blood flow to the genital organs. Um, same thing can happen in the back. If you have some generalized atherosclerosis and most of us living in this country have that. You know, we started getting atherosclerosis at the age of 10. Uh, and so it's not really, it, it, it makes sense that people's low backs would, would kind of not do well but we haven't really given a lot of thought to this blood flow issue. So what can you do to improve the blood flow to the area of your back? You could kind of do what you would do to reverse heart disease, eat a totally whole food plant-based diet, eliminate the oils, add handfuls of greens throughout the day, to increase the nitric oxide, which will relax your arteries and improve the blood flow. So there are several reasons why you would wanna do this for your back. When it comes directly to the question of whether osteopenia is contributing, osteopenia is not osteoporosis. You still, you may have a little thinning of the bone, but that kind of occurs with us over time. Our bones usually last and don't, uh, crumble into the ground, the major, vast majority of us, unless you have pretty significant osteoporosis. Um, and so that I agree with Scott is probably not contributing to the discomfort that you're feeling. Uh, but there's another issue, osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, some people get it in their hands, some people get it in their back, some people get it in their knees. Uh, you know, need knee replacement or hip replacements. And, and we don't replace backs or necks very well, but boy, I've seen a lot of bad osteoarthritis. And that leads to that spinal stenosis. Along with the discs degenerating, you also can get inflammatory changes, which the body lays down some extra bony overgrowth. It's not thinning of the bone. It's the body's response to the inflammation going on that's narrowing the canal to your arteries. And so whatever you can do to reduce the inflammation, it's come to these classes, avoid the oils, increase the dark green leafies in your diet. You know, those are, are things that you can do. And, uh, you know, make sure the surgeon doesn't, you know, need to do a surgery like an EMG, uh, electromyelogram. You can kind of test the nerve function and see if you have nerve root compression. We have new technologies these days that help us decide, do you need surgery or don't you need surgery? 
And uh, surely I'd get more than one opinion if you were advised to have surgery. But there are a number of ways that you can do this. And are you taking turmeric every single day of your life? If you're not, you may want to consider doing that along with a pinch of pe pepper. Is, is that turmeric the same as uh, curcumin? And is it OK to take those? Um that in, in supplement form, or is it just really best to use turmeric? Scott, you can take, wanna... yeah, yeah, you can take it in supplement form. So, so Dr. Greger's, for Dr. Greger, it's a quarter teaspoon once a day with a pinch of black pepper, but you can also uh, take it, take the, over the, the, you know, the, the capsules that they have. I know I think you have to take like two of them, I think, but to get the same as a quarter teaspoon, the same effect, but is but yeah, so curcumin, curcumin is the yellow pigment in yeah. the turmeric that is the anti-inflammatory. So yeah. So, but that's the way I think I bought it once before is curcumin capsules. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. So make sure you're taking that. Uh, there are, you want to be taking a slew of antioxidants to combat any free radicals that develop in your body. And the antioxidants, where do most of those come from? Uh, green, the, green. the fruits and vegetables in your life. Um, yeah, right. Blueberries, strawberries, cherries, packed with antioxidants. So if you're kind of, you know, I don't know, it's too much sugar in fruit. If you got that idea, you got to get rid of that and say, you know, I'm gonna have a bit more of that because it has so much antioxidant, it's gonna cut down the inflammation and I am not gonna eat, I don't care who I'm with, anything that is gonna break down into free radicals, the meat, dairy, and eggs, I'm just not doing it and I'm not doing any processed foods. I don't care if it's a birthday party, I'm not doing it for my back's sake. What if That's I, what if I, I thought. Find uh, dehydrated uh, cherries or blueberries that don't have sugar added. Are those okay? Yes. Absolutely. They're just fine. Okay. Anybody have any other additional thoughts? You know, I'm the old guy in the room, so I kind of kind of raise my voice a little bit, whatever <laughs> it is. Try to imprint it in your brain. You know, I don't get mad or if you don't choose to do it. I just don't know what else I can do except it's jump good, up and down. It's good to I have can it. scream. I can yell. I don't know to what to do. Okay. Well, and I don't have any problem being the odd person out because I am still wearing a mask everywhere I go in public, and I'm still not going to restaurants, and I'm still not going to parties, and uh, and I have friends who think I'm very very odd, but. You know, uh, I have this joke with a friend of, hey, don't you know the pandemic's over? Well, I follow the numbers. I know there's a lot of COVID being around. I still don't yeah. want to get sick, so I still wear my mask. And I'm, I'm usually the only person in lots of places, and I don't mind that at all. Well, we uh, tend to agree with you on those issues. So uh, I still wear a mask when I go well, out I with crowds. A little bit of a, yeah, an activist. <laughs> Good for you. Anybody else have any thoughts? While we're talking about supplements, um, I wanted to ask uh, what your opinion is on Qunol, um, Q-U-N-O-L, which is um, supposed to be good for blood pressure and um, heart. Do you know what, yeah. what it is? Yeah, Q and all, it's like COQ10, I think is what it is, right? Um, but uh... COQ10 is one form, but there's another liquid that, yeah, there's a liquid, CQ10 or whatever you call it. CO2. If you're taking a statin, it's probably worth taking that from my understanding. But if you're not, I, I haven't heard Gregor talk about that being a, a reasonable thing to take or pretty much anybody else i okay uh, um i don't know 
And statins lower cholesterol, right? They do. Yeah. Okay. But so does eating a whole food plant-based diet. And it does it equally as well for most okay. people. Right. And one right. has side effects and the other method doesn't. The statins so far, have so side far, effects. So far, I don't have to take anything. My cholesterol is a little bit high, but I don't, I'm not taking anything for it. So hopefully it'll come down with the change in diet. Yeah, so it it likely will, and um, any other thoughts from anyone? Yeah, yeah the video you're going to show, right? The uh, yeah, the I'm FSS ready segment. whenever whenever we have everybody comfortable that they've had a few of their questions answered. We're gonna play a video, I guess, next. Uh, feel free to break in before we get to it, if you want to. And it's a fun one. I think you'll enjoy listening to it if you haven't already heard it. And even if you have heard it, let me tell you, uh, it's fun to listen to anyway. I enjoy it every time listening to uh, Caldwell Esselstyn's son, his son is uh, Rip Esselstyn, and he talks about plant strong and healthy living, and it's a TED talk that he's given. So let's go ahead and play it, and then we'll see if you have further questions. So I'm wearing my shirt inside out, and a lot of you have pointed that out to me. And uh, I do this from time to time, and when somebody says it, uh, I say, I know I'm wearing my shirt inside out. I'm doing it on purpose, and I'm doing it <clears throat> to help people turn their health around. And they say, well, how do you do that? And here's, and here's the story. So I became a firefighter to help people to save lives, and to slay dragons. Now, obviously, we're not slaying real dragons, but that's, what we, that's our term for slaying fires. And a fire is really a living, breathing entity, and it's hell-bent on creating all the destruction and devastation that it can. And so we, as firefighters, have to use all of our wit, and we have to outwit, outsmart it, and outlast it. And whether it's an offensive fire or a defensive fire, there are certain tactics. But the essence of basically killing a fire is you got to put the wet stuff on the red stuff. And it doesn't matter if it's a house fire, an apartment fire, a high-rise fire, or if it's a wildland fire, we got to put the wet stuff on the red stuff. Now, I retired from firefighting a little over three years ago. So uh, I am no longer fighting fires, but I now am still I'm helping people, I'm saving lives, and I'm slaying, I'm slaying a different type of dragon. The dragon that I am slaying today is what I call the five-headed chronic western disease dragon. And this, over the last 100 years, has gained more strength and power and momentum. And it is flying around, and it is creating more, more death and destruction right, on different individuals, families, cities, and states in this country, it's just absolutely amazing. And let me introduce you to this five-headed dragon. So right here, we have the leader of the pack. We have heart disease. A hundred years ago, heart disease wasn't even on the map as one of the top 10 killers of Americans. Today, it's first and foremost. One out of two of us will die of heart disease. Here, we have breast cancer and prostate cancer. Cancer will overtake heart disease as the number one killer of Americans if the trends continue. And in the back row here, we have diabetes and we have obesity. Close to 50% of Americans by 2030 will be either pre-diabetic or, di or diabetic, and over 70% of America is now overweight or obese. This dragon is playing for keeps, okay? It's playing hardball. And the current paradigm that we're using to try and slay this dragon is having absolutely no effect whatsoever. There's, there's a saying, you can't break a glass bottle from the inside. And what we're currently doing, 
with pills and procedures and more legislation and more doctors, we're not going to break that glass bottle. We have to think outside the box. And the answer is plant-based nutrition, something so simple yet so profound and so inexpensive that we can absolutely lay waste to this dragon that now comprises 75% of this country's health care costs, right? Five diseases, 75% of our health care costs. And we know beyond a shadow of a doubt, every one of these diseases is either preventable or reversible with plant-based nutrition. Now let me tell you why I have so many ripples of hope about what we can do as a country uh, going forward. We did something really remarkable at a little firehouse in Austin, Texas. We had an event that led to the, a discovery that one of our own was basically a dead man walking. And so I challenged these guys for 28 days, let's eat all plant strong. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains and beans, some nuts and seeds. And these guys in 28 days morphed themselves from medical time bombs into healthy superheroes. It was absolutely amazing. And it was the spark that we needed and the confidence that these guys needed to start a wellness revolution at a firehouse in Austin, Texas, the land of beef. <clears throat> and so we just fed on this. And, uh, and the reason we were so successful is because we made health a habit at the fire station. And some of the things that made it easy is the guys at the fire station, they're my second family. So we had tons of support. We had an amazing amount of love between us, compassion, respect, and admiration. So we had the support that you need. We developed routines. Every day we'd come in and we'd have a plant strong lunch that we'd share together. Then we'd have a CrossFit workout in the afternoon. Then we'd have a dinner, a plant strong dinner. And we would alternate who would buy and shop for the food. And then together, we would cook it and eat it and then clean up afterwards. And then the next morning, we'd have a plant strong breakfast. And then before we left at noon the next day, we'd have a plant strong lunch. So these are routines that became consistent for years, for months, and years. And then I had to educate these guys. These guys had the, you know, the same questions that everybody has. Well, where am I getting my protein from plants? Right? What about calcium? And I said, listen, as far as protein concerned, it's a boogeyman, right? Don't worry about it. The term, the scientific term, the medical term for a protein deficiency is quashia core, and you don't know it, and you don't even have to mess with it. And then for calcium, calcium, I mean, calcium comes from the ground. It's a mineral, right? If you want to get a first class, highly absorbable form, you want to get it from plants, not from calcium. It's not calcium, it's calcium. <laughs> <clears throat> and then these guys, you know, they, they had a huge disconnect between what they thought was healthy and what in reality was healthy. So let's slay some of those dragons here together. So first, they thought red meat put hair on their chests and made them more manly. And I said, guys, no, it doesn't. What it does is it puts plaque in your arteries and it makes you less of a man. The canary in the coal mine when it comes to heart disease, the first sign is an underperforming penis. <laughs> and I said, you take a look at the size of the arteries that go up to the brain, to the heart, down into the legs. They're all about five millimeters in diameter, about the size of this straw here. You take a look at the size of the artery that goes to the male penis, it's one millimeter. It's about the size of this coffee stirring straw right here. And what happens after you eat all that meat, right? It gets clogged up with all the fat and the cholesterol and the animal protein. And that's problematic. So if you want to slay that erectile dysfunction dragon and allow your Puff the Magic dragon to roar, <laughs> then you want to ditch the meat and you want to reach for the plants. These guys were absolutely convinced that chicken was like the cat's meow when it came to to health food. I said, listen guys, never mind the cat. This doesn't even belong in your dog's breakfast bowl. All right? It's got the exact same amount, the exact same amount of cholesterol as red meat. It's got the same amount of problematic animal protein. And the leanest piece of chicken is still 20% saturated fat. 
You're not going to be slaying any dragons with this guy here. Okay, Rip, fine, but fish. Fish is the gold standard when it comes to a healthy meat, right? And I said, no, it's the tin standard, okay? Most fish has more cholesterol than red meat or chicken. Salmon, which is considered the healthiest, is 50 milligrams of cholesterol. You still got the problematic animal protein and varying amounts of, the, of bad fats. Don't go there, guys. Okay, fine, Rip, but the egg, the egg is the perfect food, right? We know it's the perfect food. Yeah, it's the perfect food if you want to continue to feed the dragon. If you want to slay the dragon, you got to get rid of the egg, right? One egg yolk, almost 200 milligrams of dietary cholesterol. It's the same amount as two Burger King Whoppers. And the egg white is a concentrated source of animal protein. Now, these guys knew that processed and refined foods were not healthy. They knew about the sugar and the pop and the fried chips and the candy bars, but they had no idea that extracted plant oils weren't heart healthy and weren't beneficial. So I said, listen, this epitomizes the triumph of marketing over science. Let's pick on olive oil for a second. It takes 1,375 olives that you have to squeeze to death, right, to get enough olive oil for one 32 ounce bottle. And you get rid of all the fiber and the water and the phytonutrients and the antioxidants in the water. And you're left with 100% fat, the most concentrated source of calories on the planet and it's 15% saturated fat. And all it's doing is contributing to America's heart disease and obesity epidemic. Okay, but milk, milk does a body good, right? <laughs> and I said, guys, milk does no body any good, all right? You've been marketed to death, don't buy the hype. As a matter of fact, this milk is just liquid meat, is what it is. It's got the ver a very similar nutritional composition. And as a matter of fact, one eight ounce glass of whole milk has the same amount of saturated fat as four slices of bacon. Okay, fine. But cheese, don't take away our cheese, whatever you do, because we love our cheese. And I said, I know you love your cheese, and that's exactly why I need to take it from you. Because you know what? When I think of a loving relationship, I think of something that also loves you right back. And that cheese does not love you back not one iota. And so I hereby declare that you all are in an abusive relationship <laughs> with cheese and you need to kick it out of your life. Okay, fine, but don't take away our yogurt. I mean, this is like, this is the Mediterranean, like super food, right? People can live to be 100 on this stuff, right? And I'm said, again, guys, it's the magic of marketing, all right? For example, this newfangled Greek yogurt that's zero fat and twice the amount of protein, it's twice the amount of problematic animal protein, right? That's promoting tumors and cancers, that's um, leaching calcium from your bones, that's harsh on the kidneys and the liver, right? You don't need to go there. You can get everything you need from plants. And to put the nail into the coffin, I said, guys, we're the only mammals that drink another mammal's secretions, okay? You don't need to go there, not one bit. Uh, there's 51,000 mammals on the planet, and we're the only ones that have the unmitigated audacity to go there, all right? Don't need to do it. So <clears throat> the other thing we did at the fire station after I educated them is we surrounded ourselves with these fantastic Mantastic foods. So it filled them up without filling them out. It made them, t it, it tasted great and it made them feel fantastic. So we did like these great breakfast bowls with plant based milks. Spelt blueberry pancakes as big as manhole covers. <laughs> Quinoa and fruit, right? The magic grain, almost 20% protein. Oatmeal waffles with nice applesauce on top. Uh, and then for lunches and dinners, we would do, you know, all time, you know, all American favorites. We do plant strong pizzas, portobello mushroom fajitas with all the fixins, a lentil oat loaf that's kind of glazed with barbecue sauce on the bottom and the top, macaroni and not cheese, <laughs> red lentil sloppy joes that were a lunchtime favorite, bean and grain burgers, red curry tofu stir fry, three bean chili, kale ceviche salad, kale. It's angry lettuce, 
right? And it needs to be tamed. So we would take a little bit of lemon juice, avocado, uh, some spices, and drive it in there. Sweet potato lasagna, an all-time dinner favorite, makes fantastic leftovers. Black beans and rice extravaganza. This is the ultimate peasant food. We could feed five hungry firefighters for less than $15. Dark chocolate oatmeal cookies for, uh, for dessert, chocolate mousses, date nut crust fruit pies, and then a variety of fruits. But what happened is, over the course of 28 days and then beyond, these guys developed a much more sophisticated and mature palate that appreciated all the little nuances and subtleties that are in these plant-based foods. And when you're eating the standard American diet, all you're really tasting is the salt and the sugar and the fat that it's all laced with. So I challenge you all, if you really want to like develop a, a sophisticated palate, go plant strong. And also what happened with these guys over the 28 days, they started pooping perfectly regularly, right? <laughs> most Americans, most Americans are consuming five to 15 grams of fiber a day. You start eating plant-based, all of a sudden it goes up to 30 to 70 grams of fiber, and now you're as regular as a Swiss commuter train, okay? <laughs> and you're light and unencumbered, and the quality of your life goes through the roof. So you gotta kick the habit. And I'm not talking about smoking cigarettes right now, but I wanna talk about cigarettes for a second right now. 50 years ago, close to 50% of America was smoking cigarettes. Now it's less than 20%. And what happened is America basically got educated and, and, and understood that smoking cigarettes was not good for your health, okay? We need to do the same thing around the standard American diet. And this is more insidious and more destructive than smoking cigarettes. Now, 94% of, of, our, of our calories are calories that don't count. They're destructive instead of constructive. Only a mere 6% are coming from fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans that are really constructive, um, healthy calories. So we need a complete paradigm shift that goes on in this country. And so this is what I want you to do. I want you to make health a habit. Take the 28-day challenge, okay, and change your health destiny. Change your relationship with food. You will forever have a different relationship. Find support. This culture, this society, does not support healthy living or healthy eating right now. So you need to find support at family, at work, online. There's all kinds of uh, communities where you can get support. Develop routines that make this sustainable, whether it's breakfast, you know, every morning the same thing, Monday through Friday, whether it's um, finding a couple restaurants that you can go to, but find routines. Educate yourself. Read the litany of fantastic books that are out there on this subject. Because once you have the knowledge, it's a different ballgame. And then surround yourself with healthy foods. We do not want this to be about willpower. Okay? So have a nice, sterile environment at home. And then make food you enjoy. You saw the fantastic pictures that we were eating at the firehouse. This is not about deprivation. This is about empowerment. And if you're a true foodie, you'll want to go towards eating plant-based. 99% of the food on the planet comes from plants. A mere 1% comes from animals and animal byproducts. So, I have so many ripples of hope going forward that this country can turn it around. I know that if a little firehouse in Austin, Texas can do it, any house in America can do this. And I know that the trends are changing. I, I've seen it with my own eyes over the last six years, right? I've seen Forks Over Knives become the number one viewed and selling documentary in America for the last two years. I've seen the fast food president, right, go plant-based. I've seen media moguls like Oprah and Ellen that are now pushing plants. I've seen CEOs like John Mackey and, uh, and Biz Stone of Twitter and Bill Ford of the Ford Motor Corporation that are going plant-based. I've seen professional athletes like Serena and Venus Williams and the number one running back in the NFL, Arian Foster, are now plant-based, okay? The time is here, the time is now. Go plant strong, slay, slay the five-headed dragon in your life and it all starts with what's at the end of your fork, your spoon, and your knife. Awesome! <laughs>
I always love playing that one. Okay, so anybody out to slay a dragon or two? I, uh, I've heard that stuff before, uh, Charlie. Uh, have have you? you? You must have also. I saw you <laughs> smiling, man. You were smiling. <laughs> All those important topics. Hey, I got a couple questions just in summary. Forks over knives is two years in a row the most watched what? Oh, it was a little documentary, but it's uh, it was way back in 2011. I'm not sure what year that was recorded for Rip Esselstyn there just now, but but it's not, you know, it's uh, I have it up on the website if you haven't seen it yet, the Forks Over Knives. Um, Most of you guys have all seen that movie. <clears throat> he has five-headed dragon, uh, heart disease, cancer, obesity. Did anybody get the other two? Diabetes. Prostate, yeah, breast cancer, prostate kinds of cancer. cancer. Yeah. 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 Breast and prostate, diabetes, obesity, heart disease. Uh, must be, there has to be there? one more. There's two kinds of cancers. Yeah, breast and prostate. And then we had heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. Those are the five that he had on there. Anyway, what a great. Uh, so I've been doing this about 14 months been joining in on these uh, that's quite a uh, wonderful summary of what we've learned in one year of you know the year of 22 of our um, topics 2022 anyway that's that's a heck of a speech <laughs> <laughs> well it's a TED talk and they usually uh Pick people who uh, have something important to say and say it in a way that uh, keeps your interest. So um, it, it is a very important topic. And um, um, I actually heard him when I, he was up in Portland one time, I think it was. Um, anyway, it was, it's been fun listening to him. So, you know, I'm a fan of uh, Jeff Novak. So his incredible presentation on calorie density, um, will will we be seeing that again during this <laughs> um, year of um, topics? For sure. Of course, you can watch it anytime you want. It's on the website. <laughs> I just wanted to say it. I just wanted to, for, any, for the people that are newer, um, boy, that's my favorite talk. Calorie density, it's all there. Yeah, I love that one too. It's one of my favorites too, Ken. Thanks for sharing that. Anybody else have something they care to share for a moment and then we can get back. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Sandra. I, I think I was a little shocked to see the olive oil on his crossed out list. That was kind of shocking. <laughs> uh, were you? Yeah, I mean, because uh, it seems like every book you read, every video you watch, they're always praising olive oil and trying to get you to eat olive oil if you eat oil, practically. And that's the first time I've ever heard anybody say, I mean, I've always noticed it has a lot of calories, though, you know, <laughs> and it's like, Gosh, that's so weird. Everybody says it's so healthy, but it's the good fat, you know. Yeah. That good fat thing is always confusing. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, that's a great point you bring up because you know, whenever we whenever we talk about food, it's always, well, is a food healthy? Well, compared to what? So I guess you could say olive oil is healthy compared to coconut oil, compared to trans fat, compared to bacon, com compared to sausage. Compared, right. to lot, compared to a lot of things, it's health, health, you know, you could say it's healthy compared to a lot of things. So yeah. it's the better choice, but, but it's not, but it's, a, it's just a processed food and it's hundred percent fat and it still injures the arteries and it still has, still contains bad fat too. It still contains saturated fat as well. And it still injures us and injures our health overall. And so it's, yeah, is it a, if, if you're going to, use it if you're gonna if it's a choice between the coconut oil or the olive oil the olive oil is the better choice but better choice yet would be not to use oil at all so 
yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. So that's a but that's a great point you bring up. Okay. Well, what do you guys suggest um, swapping out when a recipe for like salad calls for like a balsamic vinegar or balsamic uh, or an oil and vinegar type dressing? I know the creamy ones I stay away from, but right. that's a good question. <laughs> Yeah, so there's lots of recipes for uh, salad dressings without oil, and you can just just do balsamic vinegar, or you can like I do one where I mix. It's called three two one, so it's three parts balsamic vinegar, two parts mustard, and one part maple syrup. So it's just a tiny bit of maple syrup, but uh, so there's no oil in that. And then on the class website, I have a list of 34 different salad dressings recipes that are all. Uh, there was two of them that have oil that were Asian ones on that particular handout I have on the class website, but the rest are all oil free. And there's a lot, yeah, lots of, uh, you can, in a lot of the plant-based cookbooks, there's lots of recipes for salad dressings that don't contain oil. And some of the other tips you can do, you can add fruit to a salad and then you don't really, it moistens it and you don't really need any, any dressing. Yeah. Or you can add, um, you can do like hummus is another one if you make your own hummus without oil. Just, you know, garbanzo beans and garlic and pepper and whatever else you want to put in there, blend that up and you could water it down even a little bit and that could be a salad dressing. So there's lot, lots of uh, tips of what you can use for salad as a salad dressing uh, that are oil free. What did you say all those recipes for? Oh, on the, the class website. So I can I'll share my screen here. Well, so the so class getting... website. While he's getting that up, uh, we use balsamic vinegar, different flavors. So uh, you can get various different flavors and uh, the balsamic vinegar on its own, by its own okay. uh, works quite well for a number of people. Works so well for a, us. I noticed, I noticed that you said maple syrup. I, I've come across that in several of the recipes I'm looking at in the plant base and and I always go past those because I think, oh, I don't want a sugar. I don't want right. I'm trying to stay away from yeah. sugar. Right. So, well, it's at least it's not, you know, highly processed, but it's, you know, it's just like if you're putting dates in a recipe is a better thing to do to sweeten something just to use dates instead of processed sugar. So, you know, maple syrup's not exact, not exactly a health food, but it's, you know, if it, it's better than putting in white sugar, yeah. but then it's just a little bit into your dressing, you know, it's, it's a, a very small amount just to give it a little bit of sweetness but you don't have to use it I, a lot of times mm -hmm. i just do straight balsamic vinegar when i and honey is the same concept as yeah I, kind of, I would use that yeah as the same con concept okay, okay. So on the class, balsamic supposed to have sugar too so i've kind of been watching that as well but is it very little sugar that's in it or i don't mind i just get it at costco it doesn't have any sugar in it. it's just balsamic vinegar as far as i know oh, i have to look i'll have to double check but i don't yeah. I believe it has any sugar added to it. Okay. But the class website is just livelifestylemedicine.com if you're new to the classes. And then you can click on recipes here. Oh, yeah. And there's all kinds of stuff here. This isn't where the salad dressing recipes are, but I just wanted to show you that mm -hmm. since we're talking about recipes and stuff. So okay. we have some here and there's uh, some other recipe websites and stuff. You can go on, on the homepage to get a full uh, tour of the website, just scroll down to here on the homepage, website tutorial, and click and watch this, and I give a full tour of what's all available on the website. But okay. uh, under resources, if you click resources, and then I think I have it under handouts from classes, that's where I have the, uh, the salad dressing recipes. So let's see here, here it is, no oil salad dressings right oh, here. So you click on that, yeah. and download PDF, you could see it bigger. But again, it's, there are two, just as a disclaimer, there are two in here that are that do have oil. There are two of the Asian dressings, but all the rest of them are all uh, oil-free. So here's Great. a whole bunch of- That's wonderful. Thank you. Recipes. Yeah, you're welcome. Karen. Yeah, I just, people were asking about the balsamic vinegar. So there's different types of balsamic vinegar. And so the, the less of expensive ones, have about four grams of sugar in it. It occurs naturally. It's just a grape vinegar. And then they concentrate it and charge a little more money for it. And those ones will have about 13 grams. I think it's per tablespoon. Let me double check here. But yeah, it's per tablespoon. So 
I mean, that's, that's a fair amount of sugar, but you're not going to eat that one tablespoon yourself. You're going to spread it out through the dish. At least most of us do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying that the more expensive it was, the more sugar it kind of tends to have or the other way around? Um, typically that's how it works. Um, and it's just because it's, it's aged, the water evaporates out, or sometimes they actually concentrate it. You can also find um, that sometimes they add sugar to it. They tend to call those glazes. So it'll, it'll say balsamic vinegar glaze or something right. like that. And so avoid the glazes, but the other ones, it's fine. It's, okay. it's delicious Absolutely. stuff. Yeah, I love balsamic. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Anyone else? Do we dare end the class early uh, because it's the end of the new year and people need a break or if we have other questions, we're more than willing to hang around. We're excited about starting classes next week again. Um, I know I cut my afternoon class short. Um, I don't know, just because, but uh, we're more than willing to stick around for anything that you have to talk about or discuss. Did the classes start all over again when, with the new year or something? This is my first one. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, so we're gonna, so how, I guess, yes, this is your new, how did you find out about the classes? My doctor told me about it. Oh, great, Oregon Medical Group? Yes. Oh, great, that's where I work. I'm uh, a yeah. physician assistant at Oregon Medical Group in internal medicine at Garden Way Clinic and uh, yeah, we're going to be starting a whole new year of classes starting next week. So I'm going to give oh. my introduction class next week, and then Charlie's going to give his the week after. And then we have, uh, you can look into the class archives from last year to see kind of what uh, what kind of what topics that we cover throughout the year. They're all archived on the class website, and um, you could either just start watching the the ones that you want to watch from last year if you want to don't want to wait. But otherwise, you can just come every week and we'll have different different topics and everything from meal planning, grocery shopping, um, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, uh, behavior, behavior change, weight loss. I mean, kind of a little bit of everything. Uh, and we just present the science and, and we'd spend a lot of time showing different videos from nutritionfacts.org. Uh, you become real familiar with that particular website and um, we'd love, love to have you. Well, it looks like I have perfect timing. Thank you so much. Yeah, great. Well, you know me, Charlie. I've always got questions. Okay, well, that's we're waiting for him, Ken. Well, I'm sorry. This is kind of a review from last week. Um, I was I was attending the class, but I was depressed because uh, I was at I was at Lake Tahoe, and a bear got into my van and stole my uh, three hundred dollar Yeti cooler. Wow! Oh no! <laughs> so I was I was depressed for a couple of days. Wow! Never did find it, but you know it's got to be around the the neighborhood somewhere. <laughs> four feet of snow, four or five feet of snow, and. Uh, Cooler's white, so I I could never find it. Um, so I didn't ask. I was trying to take notes. Um, can we talk a little bit on a review about carotene and choline and something to do with turmeric? Turmeric. Those so three choline things. and carrot. Carotene. carotene. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. So the. So carnitine is in, is a substance in re red meat, and then choline is in white meat, uh, dairy, and eggs. And so those two chemicals that are in those foods I just mentioned, which is pretty much 90% of the standard American diet, actually get turned by bacteria in the colon into something called TMA, TMA trimethylamine. 
And then it gets oxidized in your liver and turns into TMAO, trimethylamine oxide. And what that does is it actually promotes heart disease and drives the, the plaque in your deeper into your arteries and it leads to heart failure and just a really bad substance. So the more of those foods you eat, the more red meat, chicken, fish, eggs, <laughs> dairy products, the more of those foods you eat, the more you'll have the, these chemicals, will, these bacteria in your colon will turn it, it into this TMAO substance. And what's kind of an interesting thing is you can, someone that doesn't eat any of those foods, so like if you fed Charlie or, or I uh, eggs or chicken or red meat, we actually wouldn't produce the TMAO because we don't have the bacteria in our colon that do it. But if, you, if we start eating that food on a regular basis, we'll start acquiring the bacteria in our colon that will turn the carnitine and the choline into the TMAO. So, so it's one of these things like, uh, it's a really well-known, well-documented fact now. And so a lot of the, what, some of the things that the, uh, the food industry is trying to do, the, even the, especially the meat industry is trying to do is maybe we could put something in the meat that would, would kill the, the bacteria. And so they, so you can actually give somebody antibiotics and then eat, feed them red meat and they won't make as much TMAO. So it's, it's like, well, instead of just not eating it, you know, you, you don't want to take antibiotics because that's, you know, bad, you're killing all the good bacteria too. So it's not good for your health, but so there's that. And then of course, you know about turmeric. Turmeric is your, is the Indian spice that is an anti-inflammatory. The curcumin is the yellow pigment in the turmeric. And that curcumin is the actual anti-inflammatory substance. And then if you put a pinch of black pepper with the turmeric, you do a quarter teaspoon of turmeric a day, and then a pinch of black pepper, there's an enzyme in the black pepper that actually enhances the, the absorption and the anti-inflammatory effect of the curcumin by a thousand percent. So that's why you'll, if you go to Costco and you see turmeric capsules, it'll say turmeric with black pepper. The black pepper is actually a real thing. They're not, they're not pulling your legs. So, um, but you can just, it's much cheaper just to put a quarter teaspoon in your stir fry or pasta or your salad or whatever uh, every day. So did that, did that answer those, both those questions, Ken? Yeah, the turmeric was just apparently mentioned right around the same time we talked about choline and carnitine. Oh, gotcha. They aren't directly related. Um, okay, Ken, if, we're going to get back to you. Uh, first, uh, Edward, and then we'll come back. Hey, uh, I have a question about exercise. Yeah. Um, so I have asthma, and the only real exercise I've done has been to burn fat, which is really, really hard on the asthma. <laughs> um, but it's like you, um, like you keep recommending, uh, and in the daily dozens things, they recommend um, like ninety minutes a day of just light exercise and I'm, I'm just wondering what what is that what does it do what's the goal like what function is that doing also well, a lot i don't know if you want to take it charlie i can take it go uh, ahead scott yeah a lot so just lots of health benefits to exercise so it really just needs to be if you look at the the, the studies it's a, so 150 minutes a week is kind of the minimum what they what's recommended of what we call moderate intensity exercise, which would be like light walking, um, even even gardening, um, riding your bicycle, playing playing tennis. I mean, whatever whatever you can kind of do that involves movement, uh, minimum of 150 minutes. If you're going to do really light intensity, like say it was you have because you have asthma, you can only walk really really slowly, or you maybe just a little bit of working around the house and in the garden and things like that. Um, then you'd want to ideally get up to 300 minutes, which would be like 60 minutes a day uh, of that kind of activity. But I think what's most important is just to do whatever activity that you enjoy doing, whatever whatever that is not sitting. I think not sitting is the is the, the biggest, most important part of it. If you want to enhance your cardiovascular system, build strength, you know, prevent osteoporosis, things like that, have a little bit higher level of fitness than doing more, more higher intensity exercise, a little more moderate uh, intensity, you know, faster bicycle riding, playing tennis, brisk walking, things like that would be even better. But if you, some people can't do that, so it's just 
I think for someone to address your situation, if you have asthma and you and you can't do a lot of more regular moderate intensity exercise and just not sitting and moving around throughout the day, I think would be the best thing. And, and it's, you know, it is going to, it's going to be good for your muscles, your bones, your heart, your, your cardiovascular system, um, your mental health, all your sleep. I mean, it, it exercise improves all of those things. Okay. And the, uh, like the target heart rate is something I keep reading about. Is that, that's just for burning fat, right? Well, that's more for cardi that's more for cardiovascular fitness i mean anytime you're doing any kind of movement you're going to potentially be burning fat as well so you don't really have to get your heart rate up a certain amount to burn fat versus not burning fat it's just burning calories moving is going to what's going to burn potentially burn fat but as far as your target heart rate all that that's for cardiovascular fitness you know you you, you go to 220 beats per minute minus your age and that's your maximum heart rate and then you, you know, if you get up to 80% of that, you know, 60 to 80% of that, that's kind of a certain level of, of, uh, you know, target heart rate for, for enhancing cardiovascular fitness. So like if you're training for a marathon or 10 K or a 5 K, and you're really just trying to build stamina and build cardiovascular fitness, that's where the heart rate kind of comes in a little bit more. Okay. All right. I would encourage you to uh, just focus on getting regular exercise, walking every day, not worrying too much about what your target heart rate is. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing that comes to my mind, uh, I can't remember your bird's name. It's not Shakespeare, but it's something uh, out Eureka. of Shakespeare. Eureka. Okay. Gold. Eureka. Yeah. You, so Eureka comes to my mind because psittacosis, if you haven't been evaluated by an allergist, um birds in the home uh can you know uh depending on when you develop this or your symptoms they sound like they're pretty severe so you probably deserve uh, an evaluation to make sure that you don't have psittacosis do you know what i'm talking about no okay so psittacosis it's uh spelled with a p s sit p s i t so do a search on that do some uh, like a google search for psittacosis and uh, read about uh, bird fever uh, which can uh, actually lead to asthma mm -hmm. uh, you know your health can be significantly impacted by a loved member of your family and uh, you know having had a bird myself i understand that and some people have cats in their home and they have allergy symptoms related to the cats. And they say, I'm not giving it up because the cat's more important to me. And the, you know, Eureka may be more important to you than the asthma, but it could be that uh, if there was some relationship between the time that you have been around birds and the, your symptoms, uh, it might dramatically improve your health. Just a thought. Okay, I, ha I have heard about, um bird droppings specifically uh, ha having some effect on a respiratory system. Yeah. And so the illness is psittacosis, P-S-I-T. I don't know if it's two T's, A-cosis, psittacosis. Okay. Check okay. it out. Yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> okay. Uh, anybody else? Ken? You're, you're muted, Ken. What was the precursor to <clears throat> TMAO? It was a three letter. Oh, just TMA, trimethylamine. And then the O is just the oxide. It gets oxidized in the liver to become the actual damaging chemical is the TMAO. When um, we were talking about sleep, melatonin people use, um, and we talked a little bit about melatonin and our relationship to cortisol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you're in the, when it gets dark outside and you start to get more sleepy, you get higher levels of melatonin in your, in your body and lower levels of cortisol. So cortisol makes you feel awake and melatonin makes you feel sleepy. 
and you can eat certain foods that increase or decrease those? Well, a little bit. I mean, I mean, pistachios have been shown to increase melatonin. Actually, has natural occurring melatonin in them, but um, but it's more of a your circadian rhythm controls it. So you're you're naturally going to have higher melatonin in, in the evening and lower cortisol, and then in the morning it's the opposite. In the morning, when it's and it gets light outside, you get higher levels of cortisol, lower levels of melatonin. So it's best to just work with your you know, natural circadian rhythm and do all the things that we talked about uh, in the lifestyle medicine lecture about sleep health and the, the handout that's on the website for sleep health and all that, all those sleep hygiene things, you know, cool environment, dark and not eating too close to bedtime and avoiding the blue light and all that kind of stuff. That what that was the blue about. light? I... So blue light is your like cell phone, television, computer, the, the, those artificial types of lights, th those actually stimulate cortisol and suppress melatonin. So it's that's why it's not good to watch TV when you're trying to get ready to fall asleep because it actually stimulates cortisol. And you want to, that's why it's better just to have a reading light and read a book before bed and not have the blue light. So if you fall asleep and you still have the computer on, does it actually interfere with your sleep while you're sleeping? somehow uh potentially but it's more of just when you're if you're on the computer before going to bed it's gonna it's gonna Keep affect your yeah you know, inhibit and you could potentially i mean some people do just fine mm -hmm. with it but if you're already having trouble sleeping then you want to avoid that those blue light sources wow. within four hours of going to bed okay that's harsh <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> yeah, what most of us do right <laughs> And I literally fall but, asleep to somebody talking on the computer, you know, like, yeah, that one. But if, you, but if you have no problem sleeping, if you feel rested in the morning and you're getting your seven to nine hours of sleep, then you're probably fine. But some people do just fine. Yeah. The other way you could uh, listen to someone talking to you is uh, put in some uh, AirPod or earphones and turn the screen away from you and listen to your heart's content. Really, if you turn the screen away, that kind of helps the situation? Or are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, no, sure. uh, it's, you know, you're getting the light that is entering your eyes, you know, and, oh. and so if you you've turned, yeah, however it works for you, you know, if yeah. you're having trouble with sleep, if you're not, then it's not an issue. I get like five to six hours of six if I'm lucky so it said as I've been getting older it seems like the less sleep that I seem to need and I remember my grandmother she used to like be awake at two in the morning too you know and that's what I do now so yeah I'll try anything <laughs> yeah okay What is the, uh, I know this is, we kind of go over this all the time, but it's a lot of information and my brain isn't what it used to be. Um, nitric oxide is in greens and, and what all does that lower? We eat a lot of nitrous oxide through leafy greens. What are we getting out of the nitrous oxide? So you, uh, your the dark green leafies uh, combined with your saliva and in the stomach, you get nitric oxide produced. And nitric oxide is like Viagra or Cialis, which are vasodilators. They open up your arteries, improve blood flow to all areas of your body. So you get improved blood flow. And you also... Uh, Dr. Esselstyn says you get um, the nitric oxide tends to help your arteries stay running smooth and clean, uh, helps them um, repair any damage that may have been occur occurring over the last number of hours. So he recommends eating um, dark green leafies uh, many times a day throughout the day. Uh, particularly if you have end-stage heart disease and you want to try to reverse that. Mm. 
the other thing that's important to remember about nitric oxide is we make it naturally in our endothelial cells, but what damages the endothelial cells is all the standard American food. So the meat, the cheese, the eggs, the dairy, the oils, the processed foods, those injure our endothelial cells and our endothelial cells are making the nitric oxide. So, so we wanna protect the endothelial cells that we have and not damage them. And then on top of that, by eating lots of green leafies, then you're adding to your nitric oxide pool that, that we talk about, increase the, the levels, because the more the better with the nitric oxide. Of course, vas the, your arteries open up, they relax with nitric oxide and that lowers your blood pressure. Question, uh, is nitric oxide what they used to use for an anesthetic calling laughing gas? Now that That's nitrous oxide, <laughs> N-I-T-R-O-U-S, nitrous oxide is laughing gas, but this is nitric oxide with a C, N-I-T-R-I-C oxide. I yeah, very close, Can though. you get that in a supplemental form, supplements? <laughs> well, that's what Viagra is pretty much, <laughs> but that uh, could make you dizzy and could give you a four hour or more than four hour erection. It can cause blindness. <laughs> so that comes with side effects. So you will want to be doing that. Welcome to my world. <laughs> um, so back to exercise, I just, I think I got this statement down. The more muscle mass you can muster through exercise and good eating, uh, lower the more muscle mass, the more um, insulin resistance goes down. So exercise is especially important for people that are trying to avoid diabetes or reverse diabetes. Is that, did I get that right? So, so exercising muscle. So if you were sedentary and you had lots of muscle, that wouldn't necessarily be beneficial, but you tend, people that have more muscle tend to burn more fat and, and, and uh, have less insulin resistance, but you have to be exercising the muscle. So it's exercising muscle, lowers insulin resistance, increases insulin sensitivity, which is, those are both good things when you're either if you have diabetes or trying to prevent diabetes. So having exercising muscle and not having fat in your muscle cells or in your liver or in your pancreas. And that's the where the where you want to avoid the fat. So it's just as important to have you know fat in places, not have fat in places you don't you aren't you aren't supposed to have fat, but then also having exercising muscle is a is a good thing. What's the other thing it does uh, related to lowering insulin resistance, insulin sensitivity? What exactly? Yeah, so it, yeah, so it, in, it improves or increases insulin sensitivity. So you want so you want your insulin to work really well. You want your body to be very sensitive to your insulin. So think about insulin resistance as the opposite of insulin sensitivity. So if you have lots of insulin resistance, you tend to have poor insulin sensitivity. When you have good insulin sensitivity, that usually means you have low or no insulin resistance. So those kind of go hand in hand, good insulin sensitivity, low insulin resistance. Well, are we good? Yeah, good questions. Are we going to have a uh, happy new year, everyone? <laughs> yes. We, we hope so. I plan to. <laughs> and we look forward to actually seeing you next year. <laughs> um, and starting our um, second round of classes. Unless someone has another question that they have. <laughs> I was just wondering, is there um, a discussion at some point about alcohol and weight loss? Uh, we, there is weight loss discussion for sure. Um, 
to do with alcohol? Um, we talk about alcohol throughout the different classes. I mean, it's one of the chem the chemicals we choose. It's best to avoid because alcohol is a carcinogen and alcohol is really high in calories too. It's uh, seven calories per gram. So, you know, pro uh, protein and carbohydrates are four calories per gram. Fats, nine calories per gram and alcohol is seven calories per gram. So if you're trying to lose weight, best to avoid alcohol. If you want to prevent cancer, it's best to avoid alcohol. Uh, but I hear it's a good blood thinner though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, so it, uh, it may thin your blood a little bit. Uh, depends on what your concerns are. If you do have concerns about cancer though, mm -hmm. uh, there isn't any amount of alcohol that is really considered safe. Mm -hmm. um, if you had the one that has the least potential problem or may have some neutral effects, it would be red wine. Um, That's the one I'm wondering about, yeah. Yeah, so if you have to have wine in your life mm -hmm. uh, and your, your concern is cancer, red wine would be the, the choice. Um, but I surely wouldn't encourage anybody to be drinking that. Uh, eating the grapes would be a lot healthier than drinking the wine. Uh, you might not get the same effects from it. But there are other ways to achieve um, uh, a level of peace or calm or whatever the reason is for drinking the alcohol. And it uh, could be achieved with meditation and yoga and exercise and, you know, fun things in your life, music, and dance or reading. You know, there's so many options that we have in this world. And uh, it seems like alcohol is one of those quick uh, fixes, which has some side effects connected with it. But again, like Scott said, it's kind of, um, it has calories and it has zero fiber in it. And our deficiency is fiber in our diet. So the more you can find foods that have some fiber associated with it, the healthier. If you have to you know, we all have to drink something and the healthiest choices might be tea and water. Um, and, you know, maybe an occasional uh, cup of coffee for those who just like really have to have it. And, um, you know, maybe for those people who are healthy and don't have any major health problems, having an occasional glass of red wine might uh, not be problematic. But if you're not controlling your health problems by what you're choosing to eat, then you may consider eating some different choices or drinking some different choices. Yeah, for me, it has nothing to do with like the tranquilizing effects. It has everything to do with the art of the winemaking and the whole thing is a hobby. And your friends, you know, love it too. And we get together and it's like, to actually lose that is to lose a lot of my friends. So that's, I have to figure out a, a way to make that work better. So could it, could you alter your uh, friend interactions by uh, smaller sips and yet yeah. still tasting? Yeah. yeah uh, you know, that you could develop a strategy that works for you. Right. I think that's what it's going to have to be. Yeah. One of, one of the girls brings um, a shot glass and she allows herself like one ounce, <laughs> like two ounces in the whole night. I don't know how she does that, but at least she <laughs> has the right idea. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if you're using foods as a taste, as mm -hmm. opposed to a food, yeah. uh, generally you can do okay. But yeah. again, if you're not getting the health benefits you want, then you might try a trial away from it for a while but i'm not yeah, sure I was what thinking about doing that actually like for a whole month and just seeing what effect it would have on me like, yeah as an experiment uh, if i start losing weight oh my god that's going to be a really tough lesson that's actually how one of the things i did to lose weight is uh, really? i had was having a glass of red wine every night mm -hmm. and um I don't know. I just, I just said, I'm going to, I'm going to stop drinking wine. I stopped eating bread. Uh, there, I made a few choices right at once. I didn't, I didn't go plant-based or anything, but I stopped 
stopped some of those things and I seriously lost 20 pounds and oh my goodness two really? three months and um okay yeah and I sleep better you wow. know yeah. um so I still have I have like you I have friends and will enjoy an afternoon or an evening and and I'll uh, I'll be I'll just limit it I might not drink anything or I might have a little tiny taste of something but it it's really it wasn't that hard for me to give up once I decided to so yeah well we're a bunch of pretentious silly wine drinkers that can go on and on about this wine or that wine for like yeah all so <laughs> it's kind of a little bit harder to yeah, yeah. Up, yeah. But I yeah I'm, I'm just gonna have to figure out how to manage it better you know yeah. taper it off more so where there's a will there's a way well I had already lost quite a bit of weight um but about three years ago a, a gastroenterologist absolutely yelled at me and said I didn't have any business drinking anything and he to eat like a caveman. Did a caveman <laughs> eat cookies? Did a caveman eat crackers? Then you shouldn't either. <laughs> and then I okay. lost another in like six months. I lost 48 pounds. So you basically went on the paleo diet in a way? <laughs> I don't I don't I'm gonna tell you, I don't even know what a paleo diet is. You eat like a uh, caveman. <laughs> but so do we. No, we I mean that friends. that's the paleo diet. I mean. <laughs> We'd, uh, you know, mm. we the way the caveman did whatever he could, except we don't eat dead uh, elk we see laying around and stuff. Like oh, the caveman oh, would, would have had to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, quitting alcohol really is going to help. Made a difference. Huh? It's amazing. Okay. Well, thanks for the encouragement, you guys. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's a thought. It's a thought. <laughs> I'm going to experiment. Yeah. Remember, these classes, there are no policemen here. You don't get any tickets if you choose to eat something different than what we recommend. Uh, we're here to share the science with you, and you make the decisions, and we don't judge anybody. You choose what you want to choose to do for yourself, and we just want to make sure that that's clear to everybody that you come, you listen, you participate as you like, and you make your choices, and we'll try to support you as best as we can. If you're not getting the benefit you want, and you call us up, or you send us an email and say, I'm just not getting the benefits that I want, then we may make some recommendations. But again, it's not with, um, we're not holding a hammer over your head, over okay. anything here. <laughs> good to know okay if you're new to this you're going to hear about the blue zones a lot and the blue zones are incredible inspiration for us and not only are the blue zones where people live a long time are um, plant-based uh, social interaction is real important <laughs> and uh, i don't know about you all but this is so important to me, this one and a half hours a week. It's social interaction with people that don't ask me what I do for protein. Uh, <laughs> that's a good... I think, I think that says it all. <laughs> that's really good. With, with that, I think that's a great ending. Uh, we, we enjoy coming and talking with you every single week. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. And hope you have a good new year. Scott. Thank you so much. Yep. Thanks, everyone, and have a great new year, please. Thank you. Thank have you. Happy, happy new year. year. Mm -hmm. Happy new year. Nice to see you, Charlie. Nice to see you, Charlie. Yes. Good to see you also, Arun. Do you recognize me, Charlie? Oh, my. It's Ryan. Yes, it's been a while. How, where have you been? Still in Lane County. <laughs> Wow, I I saw the name and I just it just didn't hook up. Like I I kind of know him and I don't really know him and I do know him. And thank yeah, you. It's been for, a long time. 
It has. It's been so long. And how are you doing? Still around. Don't okay. care for wine, but yeah, never, never like wine. But we need to work on our diet. So here we are. <laughs> well, welcome. We're really happy to have you. And this is my um, wife, Jesse. Hello, Jesse. Hi. Hi. And um, so we're starting a new set of classes next week. How did you find out about these classes? The lady that, oh, um, Trouty Lurch told me about it. And then Sherelle, Sherelle Smith as well. Oh, Send and Sherelle. Women. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't get the link in early enough tonight to get on earlier. But we, we, but we'll be following going forward. Wonderful. Did you get uh, sign on to uh, the website? Uh, we're we're going to follow up right after this. Okay, good. Because uh, Scott sends out a, a newsletter every week with the the Zoom link on it and the topics and the other resources that I think you'll find valuable. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, Good nice to, to see, see you, Carly. Nice to see you too, Ryan. Right, Scott. Well, take care. You too. Awesome. See you next see, week. See you next week. Bye. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.